Good morning, everyone. How are we all? Lots of nice smiley faces. It's because the sun is back out <laughs> again. How exciting. Um, so my name is Esther, as you've just heard, and I'm part of the key leadership team here, Ebby. And this morning, I'm going to be continuing the series that we've been doing on Rejoice. Really? And we're going to be reading from Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to be thinking about pressing on and forgetting. But I'm not the only one who's going to be speaking on this passage uh, this morning. We've got a special guest who's going to be uh, appearing by video a bit later on. But I'm not going to tell you any more right now because that means you have to stay awake and alert so that you hear it when I introduce it. So that's my little uh, trick. But before we dive into the passage... In 2015 and in 2022, a group of Christian leaders got together and they did some research because they wanted to understand the impact of faith on the UK. And it's called the Talking Jesus Research, if you wanted to look it up. And what they found was that 53% of non-Christians know a practicing Christian. That 55% of non-Christians who know a practicing Christian have had a conversation with that Christian about their faith. That 36% of people that don't know Jesus are open to experiencing or encountering him. That's roughly a third. So that's one in three people that don't know Jesus are open to experiencing or encountering him. But 46% of Christians didn't know any non-Christians well enough to invite them to church. Now, I don't know what you feel when you uh, hear or read those stats. Maybe you're a little bit surprised. Maybe you're thinking, one in three. Oh, that's actually quite, that's a bit more than I thought. Maybe you're sat there thinking, I think I'm one of the 46%. Perhaps you've shared your faith before and it didn't go very well. And you're thinking, yeah, I tried that, Esther. Tick that box didn't go very well. But maybe you're like, I've shared my faith loads. That's why all my friends know Jesus. So I'm good. I've ticked that box and I can just chill. Thanks very much. As we read the passage this morning, I want you to keep in mind that the main message of Philippians is to proclaim the gospel. That is the good news about Jesus, why he came, why he died, and why he rose again. And amongst this, in this passage particularly, Paul is urging us not to dwell on the past, but to press on. So if you've got your Bibles or phones and you want to get the passage up, it's um, Philippians chapter 3, that's in the New Testament. If you don't, then the words are going to appear behind me. So it says this. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision. We who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regards to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, who have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. 
all of us then who are mature should take a view of such things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. As you probably gathered, there's quite a lot in that chapter, isn't there? So for the sake of us not sitting here for the whole day, I'm actually going to be focusing on just a couple of verses, uh, mainly verses 12 and 13. Um, So I'm just going to give a brief summary, though, of the first 11 verses, just to bring us a bit up to speed. So what Paul has been saying at the beginning of this chapter is he's been warning those in Philippi about a group, it's believed a group of Jews who are trying to take uh, people that are new to Christianity away from their faith. And Paul is kind of saying why he understands about doing that, why he understands how to live without knowing Jesus, because he's been there and he's done it. So he gives a bit of a resume. But he goes on to say that everything he has lost through knowing Jesus, he has gained through knowing Jesus. So he doesn't regret anything. And he leads us then into verse 12, of where he is essentially encouraging us to keep going. To remember that we've not arrived at being the perfect Christian, or even knowing everything about Jesus but to continue to aspire to being like Jesus, knowing him more and pressing on in doing so. And this phrase, press on, means to pursue. And Paul actually uses this same verb in um, verse 6 in the passage here we read. It's the word zeal. But he's talking about how he used to persecute Christians when he pursued that. And he persecuted Christians actually really well. He did it with such energy, such fervor. It was his mission, and he gave it his all, which was actually why he was good at it. But Paul here is now saying that he uses that same energy to pursue Jesus himself. And he feels it's such an important phrase or word to use that he uses it twice, just in the space of a few sentences. And when we pursue something, it is in our focus. We keep our eyes on it. And nothing distracts us from it. And just the other week, I got a glimpse of this because I was looking after a couple of dogs for some family members. And um, I now get a better understanding of what it's like to have toddlers, actually. (laughs) It's exhausting, but wonderful at the same time. And um, if any of you have got dogs, you might know that they generally love a bouncy ball. And these dogs loved the bouncy ball balls but specific balls not really the blue one not the green one no the orange balls there were two balls but they always wanted the ball the other dog had classic probably like toddlers right they want the toy the other one has even though they're the same toy but what I noticed was that one the one dog really he always wanted that ball and if the other dog had that ball he did not let that dog rest He pursued that dog. He launched himself physically at this dog to try and get her to drop the ball. If the ball moved, he moved. Nothing distracted him from it. Not even me calling him. Absolute nightmare. But then when he got that ball, the interesting thing I observed is he didn't let it out of his sight. He chewed on it. He held it in his hands. And the only way to stop him from pursuing this ball was to take it from him and hide it. And still then, he wanted that ball. 
And he would look to me with his lovely puppy dog eyes. Please, can I have the ball? No, you can't. But it made me think that actually this is the ideal way to pursue Jesus, right? To keep our eyes fixed on him. To not let anything distract us from him. And to spend time chewing on God's word when we've got it. To meditate on Jesus. And to be responsive to God's call when he calls. But pressing on and pursuing is also about enduring and not giving up. And last week, Stu in his talk mentioned that Roman soldiers retired to this community uh, in Philippi. And I had a little look about, looked up Roman soldiers, and I felt that they really would understand what this enduring and not giving up meant. Because when they were active, they were accustomed to walking 20 miles a day with all of their equipment and armour on, which would have been really heavy. When they were due to stop, they would have had to have built a camp before they could settle, putting stakes up around them to keep them safe. But then the next day, they'd have to take it all down, put all their equipment back together, no matter how tired they were, and continue on again. They pursued, they pressed on, they didn't give up. And you might be sat there thinking, and probably quite rightly, that all of this pressing on and pursuing sounds pretty exhausting. And at times, it really can be. So why do we do it? Well, the message version of verse 12 says, I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have made it, but I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. And I felt here that Paul is reminding us that Jesus reached out for us. He pressed on. He pursued his call over his life and he didn't give up, even though it was hard and it was painful. But he did that out of love for us. And God continues to seek us today. He doesn't stop if we reject him or shut that door. He pursues. He doesn't give up. And so we do it so that we can fully understand the love Jesus has for us, which then allows us to share that love with those around us through our thoughts, through our words, and through our deeds. But that's not it, or all of it yet. In order to press on, Paul says that we therefore need to forget what is behind. And in verse 13, he says, One thing I do... And now this verb to do, that's an action word. It's not a passive thing. And this suggests that forgetting is something we need to be actively aware of or active in doing. And one meaning for the word forget is to deliberately cease to think of something. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes that can be really hard to do. And what Paul is saying here is that it's important for us not to dwell on our past failures and sins But neither should we hold on to the fact that we prayed for that one friend last week or told a stranger about Jesus last month or just yesterday read your Bible for a whole hour and then prayed afterwards. Because we don't want to get complacent in our pursuit of Jesus, in sharing him with others or being like him. And I'm speaking to myself too when I say this. Because we need to remember that stat that I shared earlier, that one in three people who don't know Jesus are open to experiencing and encountering him. But I also believe that Paul and the Roman soldiers kind of really got what it meant to forget their past sins and failures. Paul used to persecute Christians. And I imagine that the soldiers had said or done some potentially pretty harmful stuff too before they met Jesus. But it seems that they also know what it is to receive God's love, grace and forgiveness. Which means that they know their sins have been forgiven. It doesn't mean that they keep doing them, but they know the slate has been wiped clean. And if you want to read about Paul's encounter with Jesus, then it's in the New Testament in the book of Acts in chapter 9. And I'd really encourage you to read that if you've not read it before. But as I said, the thing is, even when in theory, when we know our sins have been forgiven, it can be really hard to let go in our heart. But Paul is reminding us of the importance in doing so, so that it doesn't hold us back. 
And you may be sat there now thinking about whether there are things that you need to heal from or stop dwelling on, possibly from before you met Jesus personally or since you've known him. And maybe you don't know Jesus, but there's stuff that you actually want to stop dwelling on. Whilst it can be really hard to stop thinking about these things or letting them define us, it's important that we do so that we can move forwards. Remember, Paul says, or uses the verb, to, the verb to do because it's an action. Something we are active in doing. And together we can give these things to Jesus, trusting that because of Jesus' life, death and resurrection, we can say sorry, receive forgiveness and have the slate wiped clean. So in our pursuit of knowing Jesus more, being more like him and not dwelling on the past, don't stop, never give up. So I'm now going to introduce our special guest speaker who's going to be uh, on video. So he's going to do the next little point. So if you look up there, there he is. Um, a few weeks ago, I met with Esther to talk about a passage that she'd found in the Bible. And one verse in particular stood out, stood out to us. It was Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have as a role model to keep your eyes on those who live as we do. From this, I picked up what seems to be a kind of ripple effect. So, for example, if a, at a school kids started to swear when they were angry because it was, like, cool or if they wanted to impress other kids or whatever, but if one kid decided not to swear, then another child might ask the kid, hey, why don't you swear when you're angry? And the kid might say, I don't know, I just think it's easier to take a deep breath and like, walk out the room. So that other kid might go home and have an argument with his brother, but instead of swearing like he usually would, he took a deep breath and walked out the room. Then the cycle might start over again with that other child's brother until the whole school has stopped swearing just because of one kid deciding that it wasn't right. We can show this in a community in a pretty similar way, maybe by deciding not to litter, by picking up after our dogs. My mum is a great role model in her classroom, showing the other children how to behave by leading by example, so that these kids might go home to be role models in their family and so on. This shows how one person can make a big difference. In the Bible, Jesus was a great role model, offending those who were considered sinful and unclean by being friendly, non-judgmental and loving to them, regardless of who they were. We can follow this example by being the same, not avoiding those who are different to us or marginalised by society, but by getting involved with them. We are not better just because we are Christians. But so by following Jesus's, so by following Jesus's example, we can succeed in for being a positive role model in our community, and we can also succeed in changing the community for the better. Thank you. I think there's another little video as well. Just. Um... To give a highlight of the ripple effect, there we go. So those that can't see it, Zach is stamping his foot and the water is just rippling out in circles. And we're getting um, a nice insight into their holiday as well, which is, we can all be jealous of it. Um, when you see Zach, he is here today. If you could maybe give him a high five, a fist bump or a bit of encouragement, because he's, I think that's a huge thing. And Zach, um, he wrote all that himself. And so I think he, he was brilliant to meet with. Uh, he had some really great insight into this passage. So I stole a lot of his stuff, um, which is why we felt it'd be good for him to share this because he came up with that point himself. So uh, we want to encourage our young people. So please do give him some encouragement and other speakers. You can't have Zach. He's mine now. So um, find your own kid. That's what I'm going to say. Um, but if you kind of heard that and are thinking, I'm not really sure I know what it is to be like Jesus, then you can read Philippians chapter 2 or listen to Ben's talk from a couple of weeks ago, uh, and that will kind of just really help you understand. 
But just as I bring uh, my talk this morning to a close, Jesus knew what it was to press on, to pursue and not dwell on the past. He persevered through pain and suffering, continuing to love those around him and be the best example of love there is despite being rejected. He suffered and died on the cross but rose again so that the slate is wiped clean when we accept him, say sorry for the things we've done wrong. And this means that we can be restored through him, forgetting what is behind and instead straining towards what is ahead. So what do we do with this? Well, maybe there are things that you're, there's going to be some questions pop up on the board in a minute, but maybe there's some things that you're dwelling on and you want to move on from these. I'd encourage you to ask God about that and talk to someone that you trust about it. What difference would it make to you if you can stop dwelling on that? Maybe you recognise you've become complacent in your pursuit of Jesus or being like him and sharing your faith. What one thing can you do which will help you press on? What difference might it make to those around you or to you? Maybe you realise that you've not actually been a very good example of Jesus to those around you and maybe something that Zach said kind of stuck with you today. What one thing can you change that you are a better example of Jesus and what difference might that make to those around you or to you? But maybe you're sat here and you don't know Jesus but you're thinking you might be ready to say yes. We would love to chat with you and pray with you and walk alongside you with that. So do come and chat to someone here this morning. I just encourage you not to try and tackle all of these things in one go though. Just think about one of those things. Um, Otherwise it's a bit overwhelming. But I'm going to pray and then I'll hand back over to Derek. Yeah, Father, I thank you that uh, Paul has given us such a wonderful example uh, in, in this book and that, Lord, the things that we might feel that we've lost out on uh, as a result of knowing you, that actually, Lord, we can gain them through knowing you. I thank you that you provided the best example of, of pressing on, of not dwelling on the past and enduring things that we are very unlikely to really know what what they feel like but Lord I thank you that you've given us that example Lord would you strengthen us this morning to press on to pursue and to not dwell on the past to really accept in our hearts that our sins have been forgiven and the slate has been wiped clean and would you Lord highlight areas to us where we've become complacent whether that's in praying for people in our lives that don't know you whether that's just not spending that time in your word. Lord, would you just reveal that to us and give us that desire in our heart to do those things so that we can draw closer to you. In your precious name, amen.